This is The Reckoning. I'm Dan Gediman. It's not unusual for family history to get lost. Something like a spat between siblings or cousins can lead to a split, and over the years, connections to different branches of a family melt away. These losses can seem small and personal, even inconsequential, but not always. In our last episode, I had connected Chenoweth Stites Allen to her slave-trading ancestor Stephen Chenoweth, but there were even more connections that she didn't know about. Stephen's son Henry married into the prosperous Bullitt family, who owned the Oxmoor Plantation, and that connection to the Bullets and to Oxmoor wasn't something Chenoweth's family talked about. Armed with this new insight, Chenoweth and her cousins Elizabeth and Kate Stites met me to take a tour of Oxmoor with curator Shirley Harmon. Uh, so since you have been here, you, you kind of know it was a little the bit log of... cabin. Oh, okay. Well, that's kind of interesting because I was going to say the story really starts at the log cabin. Yeah, that's um, what I'm thinking. Ironically, Chenoweth and her cousins had each visited Oxmoor at some point in their lives. Its grounds are used by youth soccer leagues. That's how Chenoweth came to be here. But this is the first time they've come here knowing that it's the home of one of their ancestors. This is Martha. We're telling you about outside. Mm-hmm. So this, uh, she was the first daughter born to William and Mildred. Um, they had three sons prior to... Helen Bullitt was the youngest daughter in the Bullitt family. When she married Henry Chenoweth in 1855, the young couple made their home at Oxmoor, where their first child was born. That was Mildred, who later married John Stites and began the family that Chenoweth, Kate, and Elizabeth are a part of. During their tour, the cousins explored several buildings surrounding the mansion, which were built when Oxmoor was a working plantation. There's a hemp barn, a smokehouse, an ice house, and an outdoor kitchen. And a bit farther away, there are four white brick buildings, the last remaining slave dwellings at Oxmoor. The cousins head toward one of them, the same cabin we heard African-American descendants Bridget Johnson, Russ Bolds, and Lisa Bolds Williams visit in our last episode. So these, these two and the other brick one were built all at the same time. Okay, yeah. And then 1850. 1850. Before our visit, the cousins had read their ancestor Thomas Bullitt's My Life at Oxmoor which paints a pretty rosy picture of what life was like for the enslaved people who lived here. But the reality of this small cabin provided a rather different picture. A single family? Yeah. Yeah. Would have been a single family. It's a very small building, 284 square feet. When the cabin was originally built in the 1850s, there was a dirt floor, which has since been covered in concrete. At one end is a large fireplace, at the other, a rough wooden door. Back then, it was customary to build slave cabins without windows. As the cousins look around, they talk about what it must have been like for a family to have lived here with so little space, no windows, and so little light. They had to leave the door open to light the fire, and that was their... So imagine the whole family in here. Yeah, and having to have a fire to in the middle of the summer. (sighs) Standing in this tiny space, it's hard to imagine an entire family living here, cooking and eating their meals, raising their children. Slave dwellings like this one were once a common sight in Kentucky. They're mostly gone now, and many that remain are falling apart. And with every slave dwelling that is lost, the history of slavery in this state becomes more and more invisible. Because of this hidden history we have regarding slavery, there hasn't been much opportunity for soul-searching or even acknowledgement of what happened here in Kentucky. It's hard in the 21st century, especially for white Americans, to get our heads around the idea that at one time in this country it was considered legally and morally okay to own another human being. What was that like? And more importantly, what on earth was it like to be one of those people who were enslaved? This is The Reckoning. Because of slavery, there's a built-in mismatch between what most white and black Americans know about their lineage. Most black families have few written records about their enslaved ancestors. So while the Bullitt family left thousands of letters for their descendants to read, 
African Americans like Bridget Johnson and Russ Bolds have nothing which documents the lives of their ancestors in their own words. This means that if they want to get any idea of how these family members might have lived as enslaved people in Kentucky, they have to turn to other sources. Luckily, there are over 100 narratives of formerly enslaved Kentuckians to read through, including several who were enslaved in the part of central Kentucky where Louisville is located. A few are actual books, but most are in the form of transcribed interviews that were conducted in the 1930s. These were part of a larger national effort, mostly conducted by the federal government, to interview thousands of formerly enslaved people and collect their stories while they were still alive. A handful of these were recorded, including this interview with Fountain Hughes, who was enslaved in Virginia, recorded when he was 101 years old. We were slaves. We belonged to people. They sell us like you sell horses and cows. If I thought that I'd ever be a slave again, I'd take a gun and just end it all right away. Because you're nothing but a dog. You're not a thing but a dog. Sadly, none of the recorded interviews feature Kentuckians. So we will use actors in this series to read the narratives of the formerly enslaved. These documents provide a critical counterweight to the notion that slavery was mild in Kentucky and that enslavers were merely benign caretakers of the enslaved. Vanessa Holden is a professor of history at the University of Kentucky. It's really over the course of the antebellum period that enslavers in multiple regions begin developing a mythology and a culture around the idea that Enslavers were like parents to enslaved people, that enslaved people truly loved enslavers and truly loved being enslaved. Now, if you ask people uh, who were enslaved what slavery was like, they do not recount uh, Moonlight and Magnolia's sentimental version of their enslavement. There was 11 other children besides myself and my family. When I was six years old, all of us children were taken from my parents because my master died and his estate had to be settled. I can't describe the heartbreak and horror of that separation. I was only six years old and it was the last time I saw my mother for longer than one night. Twelve children taken from my mother in one day. They whipped the slaves when they got unruly, just like you do a mule. Master, he had a jail on his farm for slaves when whipping wouldn't do good. He put them in there the first three days without anything to eat but a little piece of bread and water. That would make a good Negro out of most slaves. We did not have anything to eat but cornbread, fat meat, and water to drink, black-eyed peas and greens, which I gathered, and we had to eat that out of the skillets. The white people had plenty of the best of food, but we never got any unless we stole it. Whenever they would have biscuits, they would count them so they could tell if we stole any. I've seen plenty of slaves auctioned off. Master, he would make the slaves wash good and grease their face. Then he would trot them by so people could see them. With all the hollering and bawling that took place, it was just like when they take calves away from their mother. We were then just about like cattle are now. Usually those who ran away, when caught, were sold. As fast as they were brought back, they were taken to Louisville, placed in the Negro pen and guarded until fall, when they were chained together and started on their long journey south. I saw a strange Negro come to town once, didn't know where he was going, and stepped in the door of a white hotel. When he saw all white faces, he was scared most to death. He didn't even turn around, he just backed out. And don't you know them white folks killed him for stepping inside a white man's hotel by mistake? Yes, they did. Slavery was sure the worst thing I ever heard of. It sure was just awful. Those were excerpts from written narratives of formerly enslaved Kentuckians John Fields, 
Peter Bruner, Mary Young, Harry Smith, Lula Chambers, and William Emmons. One thing that is clear from reading many of these is that enslaved people in Kentucky did not quietly accept their circumstances. These narratives are filled with stories of enslaved people pushing back against the boundaries of slavery, while enslavers put progressively more effort into subjugating the enslaved. According to historian Vanessa Holden, this had been the case for a very long time. So there's a constant push and pull that you can trace over the history of American slavery. So, for example, in the early days of introducing enslaved labor into the colonies, there was an idea that Christians could not enslave other Christians. And so a number of enslaved people get baptized. Um, And so lawmakers quickly pivot to write laws that state that baptism and conversion do not guarantee freedom. Resistance was pervasive. In many ways, Black culture is resistive culture because it's like a constant resistance against subjugation that really shores up the culture and forms what becomes African-American culture. One important way that an enslaved person could resist would be to learn to read and write. The Reverend Elijah P. Mars wrote one of the few book-length memoirs by formerly enslaved Kentuckians. Mars, who was born in 1840, had been enslaved on a Shelby County farm with about 30 other people. Very early in life, I took up the idea that I wanted to learn to read and write. I was convinced that there would be something for me to do in the future that I could not accomplish by remaining in ignorance. I had heard so much about freedom and of the colored people running off to go to Canada that my mind was busy with this subject even in my young days. I sought the aid of the white boys who did all they could in teaching me. They did not know it was dangerous for a slave to read and write. Some enslaved Kentuckians took their resistance to another level entirely. In 1826, a boat full of enslaved people traveling from Mason County killed the slave traders taking them down the Ohio River on the way to the slave markets of the South. Then they tried to escape into Indiana, which was a free state, but were captured and executed. A similar revolt happened in Greenup County in 1829. Rebellions such as these, whether they happen in Kentucky or elsewhere in the world, profoundly shook up enslavers, who feared they would inspire similar actions on the part of those they enslaved. Ricky Jones is the chair of the Pan-African Studies Department at the University of Louisville. At the end of the 18th century, you have the Haitian Revolution, and you have slaves in Haiti rebel against their French overlords. And this is a story that's not told very much in this country, but the slaves win, okay? (laughs) The the slaves actually win. White Americans saw what happened in Haiti and it terrified them. And certainly you think of places like South Carolina where the black population, the slave population, actually outnumbered the white population. So can you think of that level of fear? And then you have a few conspiracies that actually do take hold. And in some cases, actually, rebellions take place. You know, New York insurrection, Nat Turner's raid. I mean, all of these things are happening in America. When white slaveholders learned of such events, they sometimes took extreme measures to keep rebellion from spreading. This was definitely the case in the aftermath of what became known as the Nat Turner Rebellion when a group of enslaved people in Virginia took up arms and killed about 50 white people. The reaction all over the country was quick and dramatic, with several states taking steps to keep out any people who had been enslaved in Virginia, for fear they would somehow bring dangerous ideas of freedom into another state. Historian Vanessa Holden. That it really is the fear of slave revolt and rebellion that leads to policies like Kentucky adopts fairly early on of non-importation, meaning that enslaved people couldn't be imported into the state for sale to people in the state, that it was fine to sell people away from Kentucky, but they didn't want people to raise the black population by bringing them in. During the 1830s and 40s, Kentuckians began to publicly worry about the influence of northern abolitionists on their enslaved population and how they might trigger rebellions. At the time, there were many schemes being discussed nationally for curtailing slavery, 
either by not allowing it to spread into parts of the West or through some form of gradual emancipation, perhaps over many decades. But as with issues like abortion and gun control today, there was a chronic fear of the slippery slope among enslavers like the Bullets. Today the Missouri Compromise, tomorrow emancipation. Slaveholding families like the Bullets felt they needed to keep a very hard line to keep such ideas away from the people they enslaved. Thomas Bullet recalled this effort in his 1911 memoir. It had become necessary to adopt strict regulations to prevent the Negroes from gathering in crowds at nights and on Sundays. This was due to efforts by the abolitionists secretly to instruct them in the desire for freedom, to dissatisfy them with their condition, to induce them to run away, and to prepare them ultimately for insurrection. Rigid orders were given forbidding Negroes to leave their master's farms without a pass signed by the master. If a Negro was found away from home without a pass, he would be whipped and taken or sent home. Even though William Bullitt and his neighbors took great pains to control the enslaved people in their community through slave patrols and other efforts, that didn't mean they could sleep easy at night. Slaveholders in Kentucky seemed to believe that they had to be constantly on guard to keep the abolitionists from infecting their slaves with thoughts of freedom. Patrick Lewis is a scholar-in-residence at the Filson Historical Society in Louisville. Slave owners feel particularly vulnerable because we are out here on the northern border of slavery. Uh, and the Ohio River is really, really crossable. Um, and, and so they fear that not only does this provide opportunity for enslaved people to escape, but for ideas to seep in. And it's, it's one thing to be suspicious of a traveling Yankee merchant from the outside who brings in his crazy ideas. I think the, the more terrifying thing for the majority of white Kentuckians, particularly slave-owning Kentuckians, is that these ideas can affect young people within the state. That's particularly terrifying. From reading many of the Bullet family's letters, it seems they really did believe that any behavior problems among their enslaved were caused by one of two things. Either they were being influenced by abolitionists, or they were not receiving enough physical punishment to keep them in line. And that otherwise the people they enslaved were content to be their servants and laborers. But it appears that some of these people really didn't want to be enslaved at Oxmoor, and really did yearn for freedom. We know of at least three enslaved people who ran away from advertisements placed by William Bullitt. Here's an example from June of 1830. Annie, about 25 years of age or upwards, a likely black woman above the ordinary size, particularly in height, and Lucinda, a likely black woman about 18 years of age, both absconded about a week since from my farm. They are supposed to be about Louisville. If committed to the Louisville jail, I will give $10 for the apprehension of each. We don't know what became of Annie or Lucinda. They may have succeeded in making it to freedom, or they may have been captured and sold to a slave trader. Then there's an intriguing account found in an 1891 memoir of a formerly enslaved Kentuckian named Harry Smith. Smith was leased out to a man who had a farm right next to Oxmoor. In his book, he tells a story about events that appear to take place around 1850. Mr. Bullitt was a very good man, but his overseer was hard on the colored men. He would whip and slash in a terrific manner. Sometimes there would be several who would run away in the woods and remain several weeks at one time. While in the woods, the Oxmoor enslaved encountered some runaways from Tennessee. The Tennessee darkies and bullets came together and planned how they could get across the Ohio River successfully. They finally wove a lot of hemp together in strips of different lengths. The night was set, which was Saturday. They made oars of fence boards. They were fed while in the woods by Bullitt's slaves, with the rest doing all they could to assist them. They all met about nine miles above Louisville. The rails along there were walnut and poplar. Being light, they were tied together and made into rafts to enable them to cross. Not learning any more of the fugitives, it was supposed that they reached Canada all safe. This episode remains a mystery. It doesn't show up in the family's letters, and yet six Oxmoor enslaved are listed as fugitives in the 1850 census. 
But either way, it certainly underscores that life for those enslaved at Oxmoor was not the idyllic utopia described in the memoirs of the Bullitt family, and that several enslaved people at least tried, if not succeeded, in running away from the plantation. According to Professor Vanessa Holden, enslaved people had many motivations for running away. Overwhelmingly, people are running to reunite with family. They're running to carve out free lives in other parts, um, even other parts of slave states. Um, I think sometimes when folks hear the term resistance and rebellion, they think of large-scale violent slave rebellions like the revolution in Haiti. Um, But really, enslaved people were resisting enslavement every single day in small and large ways. And one of the most pervasive ways and common ways that enslaved people resisted was by running. In antebellum Kentucky, the first line of defense against enslaved people running away was a system of written passes and slave patrols. Enslaved people needed a pass any time they traveled away from their plantation or workplace. Sometimes those passes were for an afternoon, but they could be for as little as an hour. Slave patrols were groups of white men deputized to travel throughout the area to check the papers of all the black people they encountered. In addition to enslaved people needing passes, free blacks were required at all times to carry papers attesting to their status. Francis Frederick was enslaved in Mason County, Kentucky. He explains in his autobiography how slave patrols worked in his community, where the fear of runaways was high due to their location on the Ohio River. On New Year's Day, ten white men are chosen, who are called patrols. They are sworn in at the courthouse, and their special duty is to go to the Negro cabins for the purpose of searching them, to see whether any slaves are there without a pass or permit from their masters. The head of the ten is called captain. He sends the men into the cabins, waiting outside himself at some distance with the horses, the patrol being a mounted body. If any slaves are found without a pass, they are brought out, and being made to strip, are flogged. The men receiving ten, and the women receiving five lashes each. This is looked upon as great fun by the patrol and the white people, young ladies and gentlemen from the verandas, laughing and enjoying the scene. This system of controlling runaway slaves was built on the notion that if an enslaved person got past the patrols and across the Ohio River, they would be returned by officials in the northern states to their rightful owners. This was considered such an essential principle that during the 1787 Constitutional Convention, southern delegates were ready to bolt unless such a provision was written into the document. And in 1793, a formal Fugitive Slave Act was passed by Congress to make this requirement even clearer. But as with the Sanctuary Cities movement today, several northern states enacted legislation that effectively neutralized these laws. According to Vanessa Holden, this led, in 1850, to the passage of an even more emphatic Fugitive Slave Act, which made every white American part of a national slave patrol. All whites, regardless of whether they wanted to or not, regardless of their personal feelings about black people or their personal feelings about slavery, were expected to participate in community policing of black people. Fugitive slave ads ask someone to read a description and then be on the lookout to read the bodies of black people as they passed in the street, to be suspicious automatically of unfamiliar black people um, and to really compare them to these descriptions in hopes of getting them to participate in turning people in. The decision to run away from your enslaver and leave a spouse, children, or other family behind was not taken lightly. The consequences if you were captured were grave. If you're caught, there are really, really violent ways uh, that you are punished, either by your own enslaver or by others in the community appointed to punish you. Um, And in many cases, if someone resists arrest and is murdered, it is not considered murder. It's perfectly legal to murder someone who's who can be conceived of as resisting arrest. If someone resists arrest and is murdered, it is not considered murder. Even today, that dynamic is often in play when police in the United States kill African-Americans. According to researchers at Bowling Green State University, 
It is exceedingly rare for a police officer to be charged with murder or manslaughter, let alone convicted for shooting someone while on duty. So making the connection from the past, when slave patrols could whip or even kill enslaved people, and the present day, when police can brutalize and kill black people without major consequence, just isn't that hard to make. And people are making that connection often these days. But there are so many other ways that echoes of our nation's past continue to reverberate today. That's true at the level of society, and it's equally true in many families. It's early June of 2019, and gathering together in the formal living room at Oxmoor are five people who have never met. Three of them, Bridget Johnson, Russ Bolds, and Lisa Bolds Williams, are descendants of a family who was enslaved here. And two of them, Kate Stites and Chenoweth Stites Allen, are descendants of the family which owned this plantation. They sit under a crystal chandelier in a bright yellow room with antique furniture, tall ceilings, and large windows which look out over the beautifully landscaped grounds. They talk a bit about their families, filling each other in on what they know and, more importantly, what they don't know. Um, And quite frankly, when Dan said, I stumbled upon some of your family (laughs) history, do you want to talk about it? I was like... Sure, history has never really been my thing, Mm -hmm. but um, this was not what I was expecting. (laughs) And um, it was, you know, we've kind of now gone to the bullet side more um, than that initial conversation, but having Chenoweth be the name of a slave trader Mm -hmm. and... um, was hard. I freaked out also, probably a spare. <laughs> and every and and carrying a name that's not Mildred or Helen, mm-hmm. that's a less common name. Mm-hmm. When I introduce myself, mm-hmm. often people say, Oh, that's such an interesting name. And for the last year, every time I introduce myself, I get this look. <laughs> and I'm trying to figure out what to do with that. Yeah. I think Over the course of the conversation, both sets of cousins remarked that their connection to Oxmoor was a surprise. And they agree that this place and the history of slavery that it carries should be better known. Bridget says she has plans to talk to her children about what she has learned, but that more needs to be done. Uh, going forward, we, we, both descendants of this, it's our duty to teach our own first Mm -hmm. and then spread that out because they have to know. And this country, this government, we're not going to stop talking about it. You can tell us to shut up all you want to. It's here. It's part of our history. You know, and we have to educate the country. We have to. We have to, you know, it's, it's something we have to do. So I want to continue with this. And I want you guys, you know, to delve into it and learn about your stuff. Cause like, I thought you guys knew more, you know, but you don't. So, you know, you, we have to give you the time also to start looking into it too, you know. This does feel, this place feels like it has so much potential to tell truth. Yeah. And, um, and that's what a lot of people don't want to face. They don't want, whether it's other, the, it's, well, it's the truth. truth, the truth. truth. Right. Yeah. And it will be all of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Probably. Looking around Oxmoor, it's not hard to imagine the ancestors of these cousins moving through these rooms. Bridget's ancestor Louisa, busy taking care of the bullet children, while Chenoweth's ancestor Mildred reads by the fire in the parlor where her descendants are now seated. But war is coming, and that fight will affect everyone who lives at Oxmoor and all who live in Kentucky. The Civil War and Kentucky's unique role as a Union state where slavery remained the law of the land. That's next time on The Reckoning. The Reckoning was written and produced by me, Dan Gediman. 
Our editor is Loretta Williams. Rhonda Rogers Van Dyke, our assistant producer, with production help from Nancy Rosenbaum and engineering from Cochin Tashiro. We had marketing help from Creative PR and legal assistance from the Dinsmore and SKO law firms. Our fact checker is Kathy Brady. The music heard in this program was composed by Jacory 1200 Arthur. Our voice actors were Susan Linville, Aaron Jones, Jackie Blue, Mark Foreman, Alec Voles, Keith McGill, and Robert Lewis Thompson. We had research help from Penn Bogert, Dave Morgan, Shirley Harmon, Tom Owen, James Pritchard, Jenny Cole, as well as Professor Deontay Hollowell and his students at Spalding University. Our series was produced in partnership with Louisville Magazine and Louisville Public Media. Our thanks to Josh Moss at Louisville Magazine and Stephen George and Erica Peterson at Louisville Public Media. Major funding for this series was provided by the Community Foundation of Louisville, the Norton Foundation, the Snowy Owl Foundation, Eleanor Bingham Miller, Emily Bingham and Stephen Riley, Victoire and Owsley Brown III, Nina Bonney, and Gil and Augusta Brown Holland. Special thanks to the Filson Historical Society, Dr. George Wright, Walter Ray Watson, Cheryl Duvall, and especially to Val Jones. Our deepest thanks to the Johnson, Bolds, and Stites families for letting us into your lives. If you missed any part of this series or want to hear additional episodes that dive even deeper into this subject, please subscribe to our podcast by visiting reckoningradio.org, where you can also find a detailed bibliography, free educational curricula, and over 100 oral histories of formerly enslaved Kentuckians. That's reckoningradio.org. Thanks for listening.